with Augusta Heights. Glad to have you with us. Those who are watching online, glad to have you with us. We do miss some of our folks today. About 20 of us uh, had a growing together retreat talking about healthy relationships with family and work and building relationships with one another as well. Uh, it was a wonderful weekend and I am exhausted. Uh, and 20 of them, about 20 of them are still there in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Our associate pastor, Shana, is leading a session and closing reflection worship time this morning. Uh, so do keep them in your prayers. We do miss them here, but prayers for safe travels as they return home later this morning. If you are a visitor with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we have visitors cards in the pews, and if you want to fill one of those out, even if we can know your name, we would rather know what to call you instead of guy towards the back with a beard and glasses on. Um, Always prefer to use your name if we can. So um, if uh, this is your first time, please fill one of those out. Drop it in the offering plate when it comes around later in the service. And if you'd like to keep up with what's going on in the life of the church, you can put your email there. We can add you to our <laughs> weekly email list uh, just so you can know what's coming up and what's going on in ways that you can get involved and serve. Uh, a reminder that we do have worship bags for our kids and uh, even for our youth as well, just ways to... Uh, stay engaged in the worship service and different ways to engage with what's happening in the worship service. Also, ways to make notes uh, there as well to reflect and continue to ask questions and reflect on what you hear. So feel free to grab one of those. They're out in the vestibule. Feel free to slip out whenever and slip back in. Uh, we also uh, want to mention that today is a very special day. Yesterday, actually, was the 72nd anniversary of the church's founding. So we are officially 72 years old. Happy birthday, y'all. Uh, I was going to get you a cake, but I didn't. Um, but we also have another anniversary this week. Uh, this week has marked three years of service for Misha Whitlock, our pianist and music director. And so our personnel committee has a little gift as a way of saying thank you thank to Misha you for your much. service. Thank you, thank you for all that you do. Um, I know she's kind of hidden back here on Sunday mornings, um, but she offers her gifts and talents to lead us in worship, to lead our choir, which is actually not singing today. Um, 
I'm going to say that we just gave her a break today. I think that's the way to put that. Um, but, um, but also uh, helping us to plan worship services during the week. So thank you, Nisha, thank you. for all that you add to our fellowship and community. Uh, a few reminders about things coming up this week, even as early as today, right now. The Pleasant Valley Farmer's Market is happening from 11 to 2 today. So if you want to head over there after worship, that is at Pleasant Valley Connection just down the road here. Uh, they have all kinds of fresh produce, um, vegan items, local artisans uh, items. So head on down there. It's a great way to support our community. Also, on Tuesday of this week, we have Ball Club. This is our senior adult ministry, Be Active, Live Longer, Ball. Um, and any and all are invited to that. You can talk to Juanita Molinax, who is there in the, I think it's leopard print. Um, I don't know my animal prints as well as some, uh, but hmm? it's the wild just the wild. Yes, the wild. One. That's right. Juanita, the wild one back there. Um, but would love to have you join us. Um, uh, Dickie and Linda Carson will be hosting it at their home. It'll be a fall barbecue theme. So wear your plaid, wear your fall clothes, your warm boots, your vests, whatever. Um, but would love to have you join us for that. You can talk to Juanita for more information. We also have a children's and youth-led service Sunday, that's a lot to say, on October 30th. So uh, we want our kids and our youth, we've already got 20 or so signed up to lead us in worship. I'll be offering a brief message that day because we will get to hear a lot from them singing and sharing and praying and drawing and doing all the things. Um, so you'll definitely want to be here. And parents, if you haven't yet, sign up your kids. Uh, would love to have them participate in that day. Also on October 30th is our trunk or treat and halloween -y roast. <laughs> right? I love that name. Um, that will be that afternoon from 4 to 6 p.m. We'll be out here in front of the church. So if you'd like to sign up, uh, there is a, a Google sign-up form that has gone out, or you can let us know to decorate your trunk. Um, to be able to hand out candy, uh, we will have candy for everybody, dress up, wear your costumes. We'll also have hot dogs available, so it's not only candy that the kids are eating, um, but would love to have you join us for that. It's always a really, really fun time, uh, so make plans to be here that afternoon. We, of course, want to remember the prayer concerns um, in our church, but also beyond people still recovering from the devastation of uh, Hurricane Ian in Florida particularly, but um, all those who have been affected by those losses. Uh, we hear of more and more violence around our world as well. Um, a shooting in Thailand that took dozens of lives, many of whom were children, uh, and even threats happening in our own city as recently as this week. So uh, please keep all of these concerns in your prayers, and I would encourage you to put those prayers into action as well and find ways that you can serve and maybe be the answer to a prayer that someone may have. We also want to continue to remember uh, Jeffrey Kellett. He's got a surgery coming up in a couple of weeks. He's also really been struggling with some pneumonia recently, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, Collins Campbell, this is Lynn and Regina Fox's uh, granddaughter. They just had another granddaughter born uh, just this past week, or last week. Um, but Collins was born premature, uh, several months ago, has been in the NICU, but continues to grow stronger and stronger, is up to five pounds now. Um, I'm going to say five. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think positively. I'm going to put that out there. Uh, four pounds, ten ounces. And uh, as, as some of you may know, ounces matter at that stage. So we are grateful for her continued growth and health. We also are grateful for Ed Taylor's return home. Uh, many of you who have been here a long time know Ed and Janie Taylor. Um, Ed was hospitalized with pneumonia and then a subsequent infection, but is doing better and has been able to return home. So we are grateful for that. And we are grateful for you for being here to worship with us today. So as we begin, I want to invite Chris Benson to come on up. He's going to lead our opening prayer. But as he comes forward, I want to invite you to join me in our call to worship that is printed in your bulletin. For the gift of faith which sees beyond the present moment and looks to an eternity, we thank you for the gift of faith, as small as a mustard seed, but with the possibility of growth, 
we thank you for the gift of faithfulness offered to those who would simply come and do what Jesus asks of us. We thank you. Give us grace, O oh God, to be the faith-filled and faithful servants you would have us to be. And let us pray. So, Father God, we come before you, thanking you for another day to worship, God. Another day to come together and to hear your word. And we thank you, Father, because we know that we're going to be able to get an understanding, a deeper relationship with you, God. And we ask that as we leave this place, God, that we put into action the word that is spoken today, God, that we may show someone who is lost your love and to guide them to you, and that they may be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let's all stand and sing our opening hymn. It's number 216, 04, a thousand tongues to sing. We'll do verses one through three. children to come forward for the children's message with Miss Tonda. Good morning, friends. It's great to see all of y'all this morning. Got a big group today. This morning, we were talking about faith, and we already talked about it in Sunday school, didn't we? And we heard it in our call to worship. Uh, we're going to hear it in the Bible verses read. And I have faith that Pastor Greg's probably going to mention it in his message today. So, who can tell me what you think faith means? Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Lennon, what do you think faith means? To believe in something, Yates. To believe in something you can't see. To believe in something you can't see, yes. If you can see it, you don't really have, fa have to have faith to believe in it, do you? But if you can't see it, that takes faith. So when we talk about our faith as Christians, who is our faith or our belief in? Who do we believe in and trust in? God. Our belief is in God. So we believe that God exists. We believe that God created us and that he loves us and he takes care of, of us every day, right? Okay, so I want to do a little demonstration of something about faith, okay? Can everybody see? Everybody ready to watch? Okay, so in my bag I have a candle. We're going to put that right there. And I have a... A what? A pumpkin? No. I can see what you would think. A big fluffy uh, basketball. Okay. So who has faith that this basketball can knock over that candle? Raise your hand if you have faith. Okay. Most of you, not everybody, quite. Okay. So let's see. The thing about faith is you don't know if it works until you put it in action, right? So let's give it a try. It did. It knocked it over, didn't it? All right, now what about this ball? Is it as big as this one? No. no, not as big. Who has faith that this ball can knock over the candle? Okay, a few more. I think I made a believer out of you with that one. You just had faith that I couldn't hit the candle, didn't you? That was it. All right, let's try with this one. It did, even though it was smaller, it did it. All right, let's see what else I got in here. Oh, I've got an even smaller one. Look. Is this one smaller? 
Yeah. yeah. Who has faith that this ball can knock over the candle? More people. <laughs> more people. I'm getting more believers, aren't I? Okay, let's try it. It did. Now, the next one's a little trickier because I have a whole jar of teeny tiny balls that are called mustard seeds. Can you tell how small those are? There is a bunch in there. They are so tiny. I could just take the whole thing and knock it over, couldn't I? But I'm going to make it harder. I'm going to take one of these tiny seeds and hope that I don't drop it because I never find it. Okay, so I'm going to take one of these tiny little seeds. Who has faith that this tiny little seed can knock over that candle? Nobody? I do. Some people, a few of you do. All right, well, let's try it. Let's see, okay? One, two, three. It did it! <laughs> Would you have believed it if you hadn't you seen it yourself? Was that not amazing? No! What? No! You held it! You no! You cheated me! No! No! no. Okay, technically, you might be right. Yeah, this little seed by itself couldn't knock over the candle, could it? But what about the seed in the right hands? It did it, didn't it? So this seed is like our faith. In fact, in the Bible, Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can do great things. Because you know what? It's not about our faith. It's about who our faith is in, in God. And so God wants us to know that whether our faith is the size of the basketball pumpkin or the size of this ball or this one or this small, he can use it, right? And we don't want our faith to always stay this small. We want it to grow, just like you grow bigger and stronger and smarter every day. You want your faith to grow, right? By coming to church, by learning Bible stories, by praying to get close to God. Those are ways you can grow your faith. But God wants you to know that no matter how big or small your faith is, if you put it in him, then he can use it to do his work and to share love in this world, okay? Let's say a prayer together. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are a powerful but loving God and that we can have faith in you. We can trust in you and believe in you that you will take care of us. And we pray that our faith will grow bigger and stronger every day. In your name we pray. Amen.
and he helps me to do the things that honor him the most. That's why I'm safe. I feel so safe. That's why I'm safe. I'm safe in his arms. And when the storm of life is raging and the billows. Scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, Come here at once and take your place at the table. Would you not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me. Put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink. Later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if you will, let's stand and sing together hymn number 448, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. We'll do each verse and then the italicized refrain after each one. Let's stand and sing together.
thank you. You may be seated. You should have heard the karaoke last night at the retreat we had. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the tithes that we present to you. This is a discipline that we share. Lord, we thank you for the blessings you've given us, and we give these back in the offering. Lord, we praise you for all that you've done for us. We show it with the offering we present to you this day for the work in your community and the work in this church. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> lesson from Jesus in Luke's gospel, which is grow. And there are for all of us songs and books, people and experiences that have helped us grow in our faith. That's why Misha chose that song that she sang. That's been meaningful to her, helped her grow in her faith. And one of those people for me, and I think for a number of us here today, is a woman by the name of Rachel Held Evans. Rachel grew up in a fundamentalist evangelical church and family, and later in life became a brilliant author and speaker, one that promoted a more inquisitive and open and inclusive kind of faith before she tragically passed away at age 37. She was a gifted writer, and in fact wrote a fantastic uh, commentary and sermon on today's passage of scripture that I will just admit to you, I am drawing heavily from today. Sometimes there are people who say it better than you ever could. And so if you like what you have heard here today, just remember these are Rachel's words that I have taken and tried to make my own. And if you don't like what you hear today, just remember these are Rachel's words. <laughs> but I can use all the help that I can get today because this is a tricky passage. And it can throw us for a bit of a loop because it's one of these in which Jesus gets a little testy. But it's not with the Romans, it's not with the Pharisees or the rich and the powerful. He's getting a little testy with his own disciples, with his friends. And all because they ask him to increase our faith. Now given the kinds of things that he's been teaching and preaching, it's a perfectly understandable, reasonable request. Wouldn't you want, don't you need more faith, more trust, more commitment to be able to love your enemies or to forgive those who don't really deserve it or to give 
with no expectation of return or to take up your cross? Yes, please, more faith. I'll take all that I can get. And yet Jesus seems almost irritated in his response. The way it's worded in the Greek makes him sound a little snarky, even. They ask for more, and it sounds like he's saying they don't even have that much to start with. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, if you had just a tiny bit, you could tell a mulberry tree to uproot and plant itself in the sea, and it'd do it. And then, without any kind of segue or transition, he asked them if a servant would have the audacity to demand a meal with their master or want special praise for doing their basic duties. Which also seems out of character for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, since he typically doesn't make a habit of speaking unkindly about servants or slaves or people of low status in his society. Just last week, just a few verses ago in the Gospel, we hear a story that he tells of a rich man and Lazarus. Can y'all remember back that far? In which a beggar is honored more highly than his wealthy neighbor. And Jesus often compared the kingdom of God to a banquet to which all are invited. Rich and poor, slave and free, even spoke of how the least and the last would sit at the table with the master. In a place of honor, even. So why the shift here? Relying on these same kinds of social power structures that elsewhere he's challenging and even turning on their heads. Why use these same structures to make his point? Well, I wonder if Jesus is still challenging those who are proud and pursuing power, bringing them down a notch and flipping their expectations. It's just that this time it's not the Pharisees or the rich or the Romans. It's his disciples. When I first read this passage, I heard the disciples' request as a good thing, right? They want more faith. That's great. What devotion they have. What desire to have stronger belief or a deeper faith or a fuller fullness. That's great. But then again, as Rachel has pointed out, from the beginning, Jesus' ministry was all about lifting up the humble and humbling the proud. So I think it's safe to assume that there was maybe an element of pride or entitlement in the disciples' requests. And I think we get confirmation of this with Jesus' odd image of a mulberry tree. A tree that uproots itself, flies through the air, and replants itself in the ocean, all because you told it to. And that that is a high expression of faith. It's weird, right? I'm not the only one that thinks this is a weird image to use. But I also think Jesus was playfully poking fun at the disciples' preoccupation with flashy signs and wonders associated with their trust and faith in Jesus. Because before this, we've seen them arguing about greatness, asking about Jesus' works of wonder. I mean, at one point, they even asked for an upgrade in their own supernatural powers, saying, you know, it'd be nice if they could call down fire from heaven on people who turned them away. And yet Jesus' miracles and works of power were not just for a flashy sign. They had a purpose to heal, to liberate, to feed, to bless, to comfort, to restore, to renew. They were useful signs within the purposes of God for the world and for bringing about the kingdom of God, at least in some small way in our world. But a mulberry tree replanting in the ocean, that is ridiculously useless, without purpose, and certainly not furthering the purposes of God's kingdom. So I think Jesus is reminding his disciples, both then and now, that faith isn't shown in flashy, magical tricks or pointless displays of power, but in those daily acts of faithfulness that cultivate beloved community, that grow the kingdom of God, like a little mustard seed, carefully planted and tended, one at a time. And like this mustard seed and mulberry tree, like this servant that plows and tends sheep and makes dinner, perhaps Jesus is telling them and us that if we have enough 
faith, to be faithful, that is enough. Their mistake here isn't wanting more, but in thinking that they didn't have enough to start with. Because even faith the size of a mustard seed, as small or as insignificant as that may seem, is enough to be faithful. It's enough to do something purposeful, useful within the purposes of God's kingdom. But don't we often think in that same kind of way as they did? Despite 2,000 plus years of separating our experience and existence, the disciples' appeal for more faith fits right in with our upsizing, bigger, better, more culture in which it's all too easy to notice what we lack or want more of instead of recognizing the gifts we already have. That we get caught in thinking, oh, if I just had more faith, better faith, I could do something important. I could do something impressive. I wouldn't be scared. I wouldn't doubt. I'd finally be appreciated. This would all finally make sense. Life would fall into place. And yet that desire for more and better, whether it's faith or certainty or any of this comparative Christianity that we fall into, keeps us from valuing what we have. And it might even keep us from using what we have because we're waiting on something else. And yet, ironically enough, when we use it, when we put that faith into practice, no matter how small it may seem, it grows. It grows by using it, by putting it into action, by bringing it to life. That's what a mustard seed is meant to do, too. That's what it does really well, actually. Mustard is a kind of weed, actually. Spreads anywhere that it can, will not be contained once it gets going by a raised bed of any kind. It is made to grow, as is our faith. Not to stay put, not to stay small but when it is small and tended and planted to expand out. It's kind of like tomatoes, too, actually. I was always used to seeing tomatoes grown in cages or attached to a trellis or a pole, but I can distinctly remember the first time I saw tomatoes growing unbounded. So a friend of mine had offered me to, uh, offered to give me some of his that were growing, so I went over to his house. We walked around to the backyard, and I was expecting a garden or some raised beds. I knew that he had helped other people build raised beds, so I was like, well, clearly, this is where his tomatoes are growing. Instead, he just started walking back into the bushes behind his house in this thick tangle of vines, and there were tomatoes. Seeing my confused look, he told me that a while back, several years ago, actually, he'd thrown some tomatoes on a compost heap that had been there, and the seeds, as they had broken down, had taken root. And then as Fruit grew and more dropped to the ground, more seeds took root, more tomato vines grew, and it kept growing and extending its reach and bearing more and more fruit. So too, our faith, our trust in God's goodness and purposes, our faithfulness in following the way of Jesus is meant to grow. It can start as something small or seemingly insignificant, but if we tend it, it will grow. It is enough. And it is grace that our seemingly insignificant efforts, those tiny seeds that we plant, can become something that will bear fruit for the sake of God's kingdom and for God's work in the world. I heard a story recently about Stan Hasty, who was a past president of the Alliance of Baptists, a member of the First Baptist Church of Washington, D.C. And he shared a story of his friend, J. Ronald Palmer, Palmer was a D.C. attorney who was also a member of FBC D.C. That's a mouthful. Palmer was on a business trip. He was flying from D.C. out to Dallas, and he was stuck on a middle seat in the back of the plane. He had to get a last-minute ticket, didn't really have a choice. And in the window seat next to him was a little girl who, from all appearances and actions, seemed to be a person with Down syndrome. The parent was sitting on the row in front of her. And she immediately struck up a conversation as soon as he sat down, asking simple but borderline offensive questions. Hey, mister, did you brush your teeth this morning? (laughs) Yeah, he said. Well, that's good, because you're supposed to. 
Do you smoke? No. Good, because smoking will kill you. Do you love Jesus? And he was caught by the simplicity and the straightforwardness of her question. But he smiled and he said, I do. I do love Jesus. Good. That's good, she said. Then another man came and sat down in the aisle seat. So there's this guy, there's Palmer in the middle, and this girl next to him. And she nudges him and says, hey, mister, ask him if he brushed his teeth this morning. <laughs> Palmer got really uneasy and said, I can't ask him that. She kept nudging him, ask him, ask him. So he sighed. He said, sir, I'm sorry to bother you, but my friend here wants to know and ask you, did you brush your teeth this morning? The man was not at all offended, took it good-naturedly, and kind of smiled and said, yes, I did. And then the plane kind of started down the runway, taxiing for takeoff, and the girl said to Palmer, ask him if he smokes. He did. Ask him. And the man didn't smoke. And then, of course, as the plane was getting into the air, she nudged him again and said, ask him if he loves Jesus. I can't do that, Palmer said. That's too personal. That's, that's uncomfortable. She kept insisting, smiling, ask him, ask him. So Palmer turned to the guy one more time and said, now she wants to know. And he could have responded kind of like he did with the previous two questions, with a smile, good-naturedly. But as he started to, the smile disappeared, and he took on a more serious look, and he said, in all honesty, I can't say that I do. Not that I don't want to, but I don't really know what that means or how. I've wanted to be a person of faith all my life, but I've never really known how. And frankly, I'm kind of at a point in my life now where I need that more than I ever have. And so as this plane climbed to 35,000 feet going from D.C. to Dallas, J. Ronald Palmer, Washington attorney, a man who would not feel comfortable doing that sort of thing on his own, listen to this man talk about his experiences, the brokenness of his own life. And Palmer shared his own story and what he thought it meant to be a person of faith. And they exchanged information and Palmer invited this guy to go to church with him when he got back home to D.C. Now, of course, that story has been stretched over the years since it has happened in this game of telephone that us preachers play. Right, passed down from one to the next. And so some of those details may have been different, but let me tell you what I know is accurate. When Palmer got back to D.C., the man and he actually did connect. They went to dinner, and they talked, the first of many conversations. And Palmer ended up introducing this guy, who it turns out was a very successful real estate developer, to the people of another church, Church of the Savior, where he got involved. And now, many years later, this successful developer that J. Ronald Palmer, through this happenstance meeting, introduced to a life of faith, has for decades directed the large urban housing ministry that transformed an entire neighborhood in what was a burned-out section of D.C. What has now become a healthy and life-giving neighborhood for low-income families all because that little girl planted the seed of faith that she had. And Palmer, as nervously and awkwardly as any of us would be, tended it. He did something with it. And it grew into something holy and beautiful and life-giving. And that doesn't just happen in preacher stories from a transformative encounter on an airplane. Some of you may remember a couple of years ago here at Augusta Heights when we gave everybody in the congregation that day $5 of seed money, right, to go out and do something for the sake of the gospel with it. We're not giving out $5 today. I just want to go ahead and lower that expectation. But one of our church members told me shortly afterward what he did with those $5. He bought, wait for it, Seeds. Now, at first I thought he'd just taken that idea of seed money a little too literally. But then he told me that he'd been preparing his garden. And he was planting his garden. And he planted those seeds. And he tended and watered the plants. And since then, he has taken those flowers that have bloomed to people who have suffered a loss 
or welcomed a child or who were going through a difficult time or who were in a moment in a time of celebration. That seed grew into something that offered beauty and comfort and hope and compassion to someone. And thank God that he didn't let any desire for more keep him from working with what he had been given. And I pray that we will not either. Because in the words of the poet and prophet Wendell Berry, all we need is here and here with the faith we have been given and here with the community of faith that we have been given. And if we have enough faith to be faithful in whatever ways that we can, doing the best we know how with what we have been given, it is enough. Because those acts of faithfulness and our faith can grow. So that one day, maybe, looking back, we might just see that it has grown into something that is more than we could have ever imagined.
And you cannot imagine all the places you'll see Jesus, but you'll find him everywhere you thought you weren't supposed to go. So go. seed that Jesus loves us and there are no exceptions and we can love 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 as we have been if you have experienced that love we invite you to respond to it to put that love of God into action and if you'd like to respond in a public way to that invitation to join this church or begin your journey of faith, I'll be here at the front to speak with you as we stand and sing our closing hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, number 320 in your hymnal. Let's stand together.
<laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Let us go then, keeping our vision firmly fixed on Christ, who loves us more than we could ever know and who calls us to love in ways small and big. And as we go to join in that good work of the gospel, planting our seeds of faith and faithfulness, we pray that God would give us grace. Grace never to sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take our minds and think through them. May God take our lips and speak through them. May God take our hands and work through them. And may God take our hearts and set them on fire this day, every day, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.